Prepare to be swept away by a whirlwind tale of a mutant goddess, a weather-wielding queen, and a symbol of empowerment. This is Storm. 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 Be vigilant day and night. Is up, nerdlings, and welcome back to my channel. I'm your host, Danny Sansasi, licensed cosmetologist and registered super nerd, and this is Comics and Cosmetics, the show where I spill all the nerdy tea on your favorite costume crusaders while doing my makeup at the same time. While you nerds watch. If you're new, welcome. Please make that sacrifice to the algorithm overlords by smashing that like button, striking the subscribe, and ringing that notification bell so you get notified whenever I'm back with another one of these weird videos. If you like the content I'm putting out there and you would like to help support the channel, thank you. We have several different options for you to do so. You can start by scanning this QR code right here. We have Patreon that has three different tiers, starting as little as $3 a month. And we have merch, 36 designs, all exclusive to comics and cosmetics in pretty much any color and product you could possibly imagine, as well as links to all of our support options and where to find us on social media. All of the products that I will be using today will also be listed in the description below. And I've gone one step further. I've provided links for everything. So all you got to do is click. You don't even have to go look for it. And one last thing. Did you know that Comics and Cosmetics is now on Spotify? Yeah, it totally is. In the mighty landscape of Marvel superheroes, one character stands out for her regal presence, commanding powers, immovable conviction, and enviable integrity. She's a weather-wielding goddess, a former queen, and a mutant powerhouse. Nerds and nerdlings, today... We are diving into the electrifying world of Roro Monroe. This is Storm. Now, was her punk phase my favorite? Not necessarily. I just really wanted an excuse to rock a hawk. I do love a good mohawk. Uh -huh. And as I always, always say, if you want the full story, read the comics, please. <laughs> read the comic. Because if I were to read everything word for word to you, we would be stuck together right here forever. And believe me when I say, nobody wants that much time with me. Nobody. And I'm pretty sure Marvel sues for things like that. And I really don't want to get on the bad side of schmizny. Huh? No, nobody does. That's some scary stuff right there. Storm made her debut in 1975's Giant Size X-Men number one. She was created by Len Wein and David Cochran. But I would say it was the incomparable Chris Claremont who really, really gave her life and fleshed her out. In this Giant Size X-Men number one, she was one of five iconic X-Men characters that were 
introduced in that issue. This was also the first reincarnation of the team since its inception. Up until this point, the team had consisted of Cyclops, Marvel Girl, Beast, and Angel. In this issue, we are introduced to such iconic X-Men characters as Nightcrawler, Colossus, Thunderbird, and Krakoa, the Living Island. I have to say that her introduction is, to me, the most captivating and beautiful part of the book. At this point in Storm's story, when we are introduced to her, she's already being worshipped by people in Kenya as a weather goddess. As Professor X was approaching her, I mean, it's stunning. You see upon this hilltop, there's this great stone arch, and this group of worshippers had come to plead for her favor. They had been suffering a terrible, terrible drought and were starving. So they came to plead and offered her a sacrifice of 10 goats and 10 sheep. We see Storm descend from the clouds. I mean, just absolutely breathtaking. And she tells these people, keep your sheep, keep your goats. I am more than happy to make it rain. Okay? Okay. In some of the most beautiful artwork I have seen in comics, <laughs> seriously, we see Storm rise up from the ground and up into the night, into the clouds. And it's just absolutely breathtaking watching how her hair and her fabric kind of wrap around her as she's calling upon the the powers of the storm, one would say. But she does. She calls upon all the storm clouds and suddenly this downpour commences. She floats back down to the ground and as soon as she does, Professor X comes over and he's like, hey, what's up? My name is Professor Charles Xavier. Hi, nice to meet you. Hello. Big fan. Huge fan of your work. You're just, just marvelous. And he offers her to return with him to his school, Professor Xavier's School for Exceptional Youngsters. And she kind of relatively easily agrees. You know, Wolverine actually agreed really, really quickly and easily too. Like just almost kind of seemed out of character. Well, out of character for what we know of him now, being that it was his second appearance and the first issue where he joins the team. His first appearance was in the Incredible Hulk, but in Giant Size X-Men number one, he officially joins the X-Men team. He tells her about the school, tells her that the world could benefit from her abilities, much like these people in Kenya had. And so she's like, you know what? I think that this is where my journey has been taking me. I've seen so much of Africa. Uh, maybe I've done all I can here. And, you know, who knows? Maybe it really is a good idea. Maybe I can help more people on a global scale this way. And I've always wanted to see upstate New York. So she agrees. When he takes his new recruits back to his school, you know, the, the mansion, the X-Men mansion, he gives them all code names, settling on Storm for Aurora. Aurora. It's so hard to say her name. Don't pretend like it isn't, because it is. Aurora. Aurora Monroe. He also gives them new clothes. They're uniforms or costumes, whatever you want to call them. But they're all made out of unstable molecular fabric that was created by none other than Mr. Reed Richards of the Fantastic Four. And if you have seen my Spider-Man 2099 video, you already know that. Congratulations. You get an A. I'm so proud of you. Storm is pretty much in love with the new outfit, and I'm just saying, considering she didn't exactly have clothes when he found her, they, she probably would have been impressed with just about anything at this point. But she remarks on how beautiful the fabric is, how it fits so perfectly, and how soft it is. She's loving, loving New York already. But right away, they send them off on a mission. So they go off on this very first mission. And this mission 
is all about rescuing the first X-Men team. So the second team goes with Cyclops to the island of Krakoa. But as they're on this first mission, we learn that this team isn't as connected as the first team is. They haven't had time to get to know each other. The first team had, but not this one. In fact, there were a lot of very strong, specific personalities in this group, and they clash hard. As they are nearing the island of Krakoa, and we are learning that these personalities are already clashing, we already see that Storm's empathetic an even temperament is very, very apparent and just a good balance to the rest of her teammates. Once they get to the island, they scatter to the four corners of it. They, they split up to cover more ground. But as soon as they land and they start making for the central part of the island where there is a large temple just erected out of nowhere and their jet vanishes, they very, very quickly realize that things are not what they appear and the whole island is attacking them. The whole island? Whole thing. Like, all of it? Like, what do you mean? I'm so glad you asked. I was just getting to that. That means animals on the ground, birds in the sky, plant life. It's like all coming for them. They all meet up at the center of the island where this temple is. And that's when they discover all of the original team members are there and they're being held captive inside this cave-like temple. And that it is Krakoa itself that has trapped them there and used them as bait to get more mutants because it's actually feeding off of their power. Storm turns out to be absolutely instrumental in defeating Krakoa, along with Lorna Dane, a.k.a. Polaris, who was actually part of that team that I forgot to mention. I'm not perfect. I just look it. <laughs> Stop. It's a pretty impressive display. I mean, like I said, not only is the story wonderful, but the artwork is just ugh to die for. Once the team is successful in rescuing the previous team members, they make their trip back to New York. Uncanny X-Men number 102 and 103. In these, we learn that Aurora was born to an African princess named Ndare, which is a beautiful name, and an American photojournalist named David Monroe. Ndare and David had met fell in love, got married, moved to New York, where they gave birth to baby Aurora. However, when little baby Aurora was six months old, the family made the decision to leave New York and leave the United States. Ndare had become afraid for her daughter, considering the current status of mutant and race relations in the country at the time. Remember, Storm was created in 1975, and she was like, I think she was supposed to be 18, 20 years old when she was introduced. So if you go back 20 years, you get late 50s, early 60s, and race relations were not very good in the United States. Things were changing on a very large scale. And I mean, that's what the X-Men was created for as an allegory for race relations, racism, and bigotry, discrimination in the United States. So it stands to reason that here this woman has given birth to this beautiful, beautiful African-American child. And she also happens to be a mutant. And she also happens to have inherited these very specific telltale traits that are handed down through the women in Ndare's family. Those traits are striking blue eyes and snow white silken hair. This made Aurora look very different from anyone else and Ndare was very worried about what would happen when she got older because as we all know human beings don't exactly welcome things that they don't know about with open arms so the family left david accepted a position a job in cairo and that's where they moved there they remained in cairo for six beautiful years the family could not have been happier however 
the problems in the world would not be shut out forever. War had been raging all over that region of the world, and unfortunately, it could not be ignored. As the blissful family had prepared to sit down for a meal, they began hearing commotion coming from outside. Fighter planes were engaged in an epic battle above them, and one crashed. Before her parents could run to her and get them all to safety, the plane came down. A gust of wind blew through the home and pushed Aurora under the kitchen table, but brought the entire home down upon all three of them. It was here that a little six-year-old Aurora would remain trapped for some time, along with the bodies of her mother and father who were killed in the collapse of their home. And can you imagine being six years old and trapped under piles of rock and rubble and wood, all the bits and pieces that were your home right next to the dead bodies of your mother and father? six years old. When she's finally rescued from the rubble, she runs immediately to the bodies of her parents and tries desperately to wake them up, but of course she can't. She grabs the ancestral ruby from her mother and she leaves. She runs off. I mean, she's terrified. So of course the first thing she's going to think to do is just run away from this. Being trapped under all of that rubble, with the bodies of her parents was a traumatic stain that would flicked Aurora with crippling, crippling claustrophobia for the rest of her life. The ruby, the ancestral ruby that she happened to take with her was passed down to the women in her family to be given to the one who possessed the traits, the white hair and the blue eyes, because those that possess those traits also possessed the ability to wield magic. So here she was, this young, magical, mutant child running through the streets of Cairo, terrified after the loss of her entire world, which literally came crumbling down upon her. It was this time that her mutant powers first manifested. And she's discovered by a man by the name of Ahmed El-Jabbar. He was a teacher who taught street urchins how to survive on the streets by stealing. He trained her in the arts of lock picking and picking pockets. And she became quite the apt student. In fact, we learn... In Uncanny X-Men number 117, that when she picks the pocket of an American tourist, that American tourist just so happens to be one Mr. Charles Xavier, who was roaming around the world. Oh, Chucky wants to roam around the world. <laughs> He wanted to use his power to mentally control her into not stealing anymore. He thought, oh, maybe I'm put on this earth to stop crimes. So I'm just going to take a peek into her brain. And as soon as he does, he is hit with this unbelievably powerful, painful psionic blast. <laughs> we'll be doing that again. Aurora, of course, uses the opportunity to R-U-N-N-O-F-T. It wasn't Aurora who issued the psionic blast, but the guy who was actually in charge of all thievery in Cairo. That's right. His name was Amal Farouk, aka Shadow King. Charles had acknowledged through her brainwaves that Aurora was actually a mutant, but he didn't want to scare her too bad. She was only a little kid, so he didn't try to recruit her then. He just went off and fought the Shadow King. And then it was many years later, he runs into her in Kenya and he's like, I think this is the same check. Yeah, he was right. Aurora had felt like something had been calling her to the South and she decided to finally listen. And she started on this very long journey of traveling South. 
to wherever this call was coming from. In Marvel Team Up 100, while she's on this journey heading south in Africa, she runs into none other but a young T'Challa. She actually saved T'Challa from a group of South African jerkwads. And right away, there is an instant attraction. They travel together for a while, but eventually they have to part ways. T'Challa has his duties in Wakanda. And of course, Aurora has her calling. She follows it to Mount Kilimanjaro. And that's where she finds her mother's people. And she's revered as a goddess. I mean, that's not bad. I've always wanted to be revered as a goddess. It's just no one's ever figured it out. As that path that she was on took her to Kenya and the land of her ancestors, she embraced those ancestral roots and began this new life as a goddess. She was revered by these people, not only as a goddess, but as their protector. It was this time that her path intersected with the X-Men and she left. I don't know about you guys, but it would be pretty damn hard leaving a place where I am revered, not just loved, not just adored, but worshipped and revered as a goddess to go to some musty old school in upstate New York. That would be tough. Her elegant and powerful presence, game changer for the X-Men, absolute game changer. Up until that point, we had Marvel Girl in Lorna Dane, Polaris, who was and then wasn't the daughter of Magneto. And they're great, don't get me wrong. I did a whole thing on Jean Grey, aka Marvel Girl. Check that out. They were very young and naive and could, let's be frank here, frequently the damsel in distress, not Storm. Where Storm did have this quiet feminine composure, she was genteel, she was understanding, she was caring, she was also a force of nature almost literally and not, not to be reckoned with. This nuance to her character made her one of the most iconic X-Men characters ever, till this day still. Storm's character self is a complex tapestry. She's not just a mutant superhero. She's an absolute symbol of power, strength diversity, love. I would say her personality is a lot more on par with Wonder Woman in DC Comics more so than probably any other character in comics, period. But to me, she's more genteel. She's softer softer spoken. And there's a lot to be said about that. The character of Storm shattered barriers as a black superhero, creating inspiration for millions and millions of fans. Up until this point, we'd had Black Vulcan, Black Panther, Luke Cage, but we didn't have a Black female superhero. Storm was the first. Throughout her history, Storm has assumed many roles, from team member to teacher, eventually to team leader. In issue number 138 of Uncanny X-Men, preceding, preceding the funeral of one Miss Jean Grey, if you want to learn more about that, definitely check out our Jean Grey video or our Cyclops video. So Jean Grey dies and following the funeral, Cyclops leaves. He just can't do it anymore. He's too heartbroken. So that leaves an opening for Team Leader. And Professor X can't think of anyone more suited for that than Storm herself. He felt that her time as, you know, a goddess would give her some experience in leading. I think he might have been right. Also, with Cyclops' exit, we get a new recruit, a new student at Professor Xavier's school, and that is a 13 and a half year old young girl by the name of Kitty Pride, aka Sprite, which there's some seriously dumb dad jokes in there about. I hope no one pulls my tab. <laughs> Storm has a particular fondness for Kitty Pride. She's a young girl with powerful mutant abilities. She can walk through walls and stuff. And she doesn't want Kitty to miss out on the childhood that Storm missed out on. So, like I said, she takes it upon herself to be there 
for Kitty and make sure she does get this childhood. She takes her out on several outings. She calls her kitten. She even signs her up for private dance lessons so that she can maintain some sense of normalcy at some point. The relationship between Kitty Pride and Storm is very tender and very sweet. She ends up becoming a surrogate mother to Kitty. And I truly believe that both Kitty and Storm got something out of this relationship that they both needed. In issue number 169, Angel is kidnapped by a group of underground mutants known as the Morlocks. The Morlocks are mutants with more of the, how to put it politely, undesirable powers, gross ones for the most part, really not ones that are really great for being around a whole lot of people, and for an unfortunate bunch of them, physical attributes that can be disturbing. So they live in these underground tunnels led by a mutant woman with an eye patch named Callisto. Callisto has set her sights on old angel, Mr. Attractive Warren, to be her would-be husband. And she's proposed by entrapping him in a very dominatrix bondage leather strap thing and just locked him up on a stage in the sewer. How could he say no? So she's decided she's going to marry Angel. Kitty Pride gets taken too by another one of the Morlocks known as Caliban. Caliban is actually kind of sweet. He's being used by Callisto because his mutant power is he's a living, breathing cerebro. He can actually find other mutants by sensing them. Even though she was still dealing with some mild claustrophobia due to the fact that they were underground in these tunnels, she still just really, really just viciously beats Callisto. And had they not had Morlocks there that had healing abilities... She would have killed her. Remember, this is Marvel, not DC. People die. Storm was now considered the leader of the Morlock. And her first act as the leader was to, of course, free Angel from his bondage. And then she frees the Morlocks from theirs. So she tells the Morlock that they are no longer under the yoke of Callisto, and that if they would so choose, they are welcome to join her and the other X-Men at the mansion. They all kind of stand around and think about it for a second and then politely decline, which is kind of weird and sad. It's really sad because they tell her that they feel like their place is there underground, that they won't be accepted above. This duel between Callisto and Storm really weighed heavy on Storm because of the vow she had made and her powers being connected to her emotions. It affected them too. And then in 2005, we learn more about that. Her origin is expanded to include that while she was on this journey traveling south in Africa, she accepts a ride from a man driving a truck and that man tries Tries to assault her. She fights for her life and actually grabs a knife and stabs this man to death. She kills him. Not that I don't think he had it coming. Raping a child. Kind of frowned upon. Okay, you should die for that. But it had a profound effect on Storm and she vowed to never take another life. For some time after this, she struggled with this nagging feeling inside of her. She had uncorked her emotions and now that grip she had on them, that control was weakening. During a trip to Tokyo for Wolverine's wedding to Mariko, Storm meets another one of Wolverine's former associates, a woman, a mutant by the name of Yukio. And Storm is enthralled by this woman. This woman has a real joie de vivre that Storm has never seen before, that she's never allowed herself to possess. And she becomes quite enamored with that. She found Yukio's personality rather infectious. So she ends up hanging out with her and fighting side by side against the Silver Samurai. And while she's doing so, she calls down 
a lightning strike so powerful onto the silver samurai that it ignites an explosion and a fire. And it actually burns off a lot of her hair, like most of her hair. And instead of being freaked out by it, bothered at all, she basically laughs her ass off and says, let's go do some more. So she goes running around with Yukio, finding bandits and gangsters and just whooping up on them, just running around saving lives. When she shows back up for Wolverine's wedding, She is now rocking a full-on white mohawk and some very interesting black leather punk rock attire. Everyone is pretty startled by this transformation, and none more so than Kitty Pride, who apparently found this change in Storm upsetting. It wasn't so much Storm's hair and outfit. Storm had been acting different for some time and that was upsetting to Kitty when she sees Storm show up in you know this whole new get up whole new appearance it just really drives that change in the Storm home for Kitty and she kind of freaks out she's like what the heck man who are you you're not my mom and like takes off in issue number 185 of Uncanny X-Men Storm loses her powers due to being shot with something called a neuralizer. This neuralizer gun was built for the government, specifically the Mutant Task Force, which had just been established since the Mutant Registration Act had just been approved, voted on, whatever. Well, there was a mutant named Forge. His ability was that he could pretty much build anything. He could build anything. So he had been recruited by the Mutant Task Force to build things to catch mutants. And he did. When he sees that the Neuralizer had hit Storm, he insists that he be allowed to take her with him to his home to nurse her back to health and take care of her. And they're like, all right, but we're going to need her, so don't keep her too long. He's like, whatever, okay. So he takes her back to his skyscraper made out of glass, and it's like made out of hard light holograms, and he can change the appearance and floors and everything. It's really super wild. She stays there with him for a while and develops feelings for him as he develops for her. She starts dressing pretty for him. She's struggling to get used to life without her weather manipulation powers. But, you know, she really likes this guy and she's having a nice time with him. Unfortunately, this man who happens to be Cheyenne, descended from shaman and medicine people, gets a phone call and steps away to answer it. While he takes a phone call in the other room, she, you know, collects herself and she's like, oh wait, I really should check in with the X-Men and the professor. I'm sure they're absolutely just worried sick about me and I should check in with them. Well, when she does, she picks up the phone. She can hear that Forge is actually on that line. He didn't go use a second line. He just used a second phone. For you kids at home, okay, who don't know what I'm talking about, there were these things called landline phones, okay? I know this is very shocking for you to hear, but you could have multiple phones attached to one phone number. Wild, right? Comics and Cosmetics, teaching the youth of today. She overhears his conversation on this phone, and he's talking with his boss at the mutant task force. And she finds out that the weapon that took her powers away was actually built by Forge and that he works for them and that, you know, they they want her. She is clearly shaken and startled and drops the phone. They hear it. Forge realizes what's happened. He comes out there and tries to explain himself and tries to explain that he's in love with her. He cares about her deeply. He never wanted the neuralizer to be used. 
He loves her. You know, it started out as one thing and now it's another, but that's not enough for Aurora. Aurora has this unbelievably consistent moral compass. Okay. She has incredible integrity that's just admirable and I completely respect it. And because of this integrity and conviction that she possesses, she cannot compromise that for anything. Not for the love of this man. She decides, I'm out, bro. No, 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 no. You work for the mutant task force. This is unacceptable for me. I don't care how I feel about you. I have to go. She eventually does get her powers back in Uncanny X-Men number 226. When she is trapped in this kind of alternate earth with Forge for over a year. I think it might actually have been a couple of years they got stuck in there. But they were stuck there by the adversary or the trickster god. While they are trapped here, there seems to be no other people just them trapped in i think it's montana it's supposed to be montana near yellowstone he even builds them a home and they live and love for quite some time in fact she goes on a spiritual journey she leaves and walks she walks to africa i don't know how she gets to africa but she gets to africa and that takes her about a year and she comes back and he's like hi honey i missed you at this point he's actually built solar panels and all kinds of stuff he took parts out of his prosthetic leg and bionic i think he had a bionic right hand too to build this stuff and he tells her that not only has he discovered a way to get them back home but to also you know return her abilities to her her relationship with forge to me is very complex very sweet very relatable i mean how many times have you've been in love with someone and it just didn't work out it it wasn't a matter of amount of love or anything you've done or they've done it's just timing and circumstances didn't quite line up to make it happen and that's kind of what goes on on and off for storm and forge in uncanny x-men number 253 Storm appears on a levee in Cairo, Illinois, while they are preparing for a flood. Okay, let me say something right now. Yes, it is spelled like Cairo. Yes, it is. But I promise you, as someone who has lived in this part of the country near Cairo, Illinois, most of my human existence, I promise you, it is pronounced Cairo. I don't know why, it just is. But she appears on this levee as they're sandbagging as a preteen child with no memory of who she is, where she came from, or how she got there. As she is discovered by the paramedics teams and local law enforcement, they scoop her up, cover her with a blanket, and put her in an ambulance to take her to Cairo, Illinois Metropolitan Hospital which I assure you does not nor never has existed. This is one of those instances where, God bless them, they're trying. They're trying to have Midwestern representation for us parts of the country that get completely ignored by comic books and other major media. So they pick a spot and they're like, we're going with this. I mean, it's Cairo, right? And that's where she lived. No, it's Cairo. Totally different. Um, they even show Cairo as a bustling metropolis. They have all these beautiful homes and buildings and all these people. No. But also, not true. Cairo is basically a ghost town. There's nothing there but maybe some trap houses. Once upon a time, back in the 20s to 40s, Cairo was actually kind of a hideout town for gangsters. And I mean Al Capone. After the fall of that era, so did Cairo, Illinois. I promise. There's literally nothing there. But she's taken to Metropolitan Hospital of Cairo. And a doctor by the name of Lien Shen takes care of her 
and then excuses herself to make a mysterious phone call. She actually calls a man that she refers to as like a federal agent, mutant task force agent, but he was actually someone who was under the control of the Shadow King. That's right. Lien turns out to also be in the control of the Shadow King and is actually the leader of his hounds. It's these mutants that the Shadow King has under his thrall. In issues 266 and 277, she meets the hottest X-Men of all time. That's right, Mr. Remy LeBeau Gambit. He's introduced. Mm -mm -mm. Sexiest cartoon character there is, ma chère. Remy is actually a Robin Hood type. He steals from thieves and then takes his wares and either returns it to the proper owner or someone who needs it really bad. He's actually there to steal from the Shadow King, like paintings and stuff. And uh, he discovers little baby Storm. And he's kind of taken aback by her. Like, you don't talk like a kid. She's like, well, that's how I talk. So suck it. But he rescues her from the Shadow King, and she actually lives with him for some time in New Orleans. And she joins him in his quest to steal from the Steelers. And they go all around the southeastern United States, robbing people that have robbed others and either returning the goods or putting them to better use. While they are doing this, they run into this robot named Nanny and her quote-unquote orphan maker. They had been tracking them, looking for her. Fun. They capture Gambit, and Storm goes in to rescue him. He rescued her. She should return the favor. It's just, just good manners. When she goes in to rescue him, she discovers that it was Nanny, Nanny, that had turned her into a child. Her memories start to come back to her of her real life, who she is, and she discovers the machine and why Nanny captured her and did this. Nanny captures mutants, regresses them into children, because she says it's easier for her to control their will when they are children. So Storm gets into one of those machines, and she turns herself back into an adult, and she and Gambit walk off into the sunset, and she's like, Hey, Gambit, ever heard of the X-Men? So he joins the X-Men. In the Storm miniseries in 2006, we learn more about Storm's childhood in Africa. After leaving the Shadow King in Cairo, she connects with another group of sneak thief children that are led by a man who refers to himself only as Teacher. They live deep in the wilderness in their own little camp village and teacher teaches them quite rigidly how to pick locks and be better thieves and how to survive on their own they're all orphans they have no one else but this guy teacher after stealing a camera that reminds her of her father david monroe the photojournalist the men she stole it from track her down to the little sneak thief camp that she's living at with all the other children they attack all of the children, and shoot one of the girls named Xenia. Xenia is kind of a dick. She is the one who kind of haunted Storm into stealing the camera in the first place and always teasing her, telling her she's awful slow. They shoot Xenia with a tranquilizer dart and attempt to assault her. But a young T'Challa had been on his journey to manhood walkabout nearby and saw a lightning strike. Stuff happens to the weather when Storm's upset. He follows where the lightning strike came from and shows up in time to rescue Xenia from this a-hole. Aurora gets hit by a dart as well by the time T'Challa gets to her and rescues her from the attackers. He takes both the girls back to their camp and explains to Teacher what has happened and he introduces himself. Of course, all of the kids, including Teacher, are like, oh my gosh, this is Prince T'Challa, son of T'Chaka the Black Panther, King of Wakanda, the richest country in the world. Why can't you help us? So, well, when I get back, I will tell everyone back home of your plight and see what we can do to help. But for now, I have to go. 
and Aurora wants to go with them. So teacher gives this blessing, which really ticks off Xenia. Xenia is super, super jealous. As it turns out, Xenia is actually teacher's daughter as well. And she's very, very jealous of the attention and praise that teacher lavishes upon Aurora. And Xenia blames Aurora for the attack on their camp, even though Xenia is the one who teased her, picked on her, bullied her into stealing that camera in the first place. Uh, two days after they have left teacher's camp, Aurora and T'Challa are just having the best two days of their lives. They're thoroughly enjoying each other's company and they're absolutely smitten with each other. And Aurora didn't quite understand it. She didn't quite understand why he picked her over all of those other girls, over any other girl in the entire world, because even though she is the daughter of an African princess, she has no family. She has no name. She has no money. She has nothing. She's a thief, something that T'Challa looks down on it, it's not a good way to live it's it's not how good people live their lives and she explains you know i do it to survive but i'm just i'm not good enough for you you could have anybody he's like well you're the one i like here they are two days in having a lovely lovely time and aurora is very scared of her emotions She's a young teenage girl. She's feeling things. Her body's doing things that she doesn't quite understand because she's never been taught. And she's alone with this boy. <laughs> so what do you think happens? While Aurora and T'Challa are in the warm afterglow of love, those jerk faces that attacked the village previously, whom Aurora stole the camera from, go back to that village and they slaughter everyone. Everyone but teacher and Zanya. So they ask, where's that girl? Where's that girl? Where's that boy? We want that girl. They know she's a mutant. They want to sell her as a slave. They want her. And teacher won't give it up so they put pull a gun on him like they're gonna shoot him so Xenia speaks up and she's like I can show you where she went they're like oh yeah bang kill her father right in front of her and then they take her in a helicopter and I'm like let's go she does this out of seething jealousy and rage towards Aurora she refuses to accept the fact that one you are not responsible for the vile actions of other people. First of all, let's leave the blame where it lies with the sickos who perpetrated these heinous, heinous acts. But also, it wasn't Aurora who started all of this. It was you, girlfriend. Okay. This all started because she stole that camera. Why did she steal the camera? You were a frickin' bully. Okay. Okay. While they are flying over and they find T'Challa and Aurora, that same a-hole tries to rape Xenia again, but Xenia kills him. Yeah, she did. When it was all said and done and the day was saved, Aurora and T'Challa go off together again. But after a time, as was in the previous comic before it was retconned here, but in Marvel Team Up number 100, where it was storm that rescued black panther now it was the other way around but still still t'challa had responsibilities in wakanda that took him there and storm still felt this calling from deep inside calling her to kenya and so they part ways however as adults they do cross paths again as it was also in marvel team of 100 that attraction was still there. And this time as adults, they decided, let's do it. Let's just be together. Let's get married. In Black Panther number 18, we see the wedding of Black Panther and Storm. And believe it or not, a real designer by the name of Sean Dudley designed Storm's wedding dress. He was known for work on soap operas. And he took inspiration from African culture, from all of Storm's iconic X-Men costumes, and also fictional Wakanda culture. And it turned out stunning. 
absolutely stunning. But their wedding gets pretty dramatic. I mean, it is X-Men and Avengers and everybody all together. And in fact, it was during the Civil War event. So everyone is on opposite sides of this thing. And they all agree on a temporary ceasefire so that everyone can go to the Prince of Wakanda's wedding and they can enjoy a blissful day as they should. They didn't want to ruin the day for them. Even Uatu the Watcher showed up. So when he shows up and he's just kind of leering there, everybody's like, do you, that's, that's Uatu. That's Uatu. You know what that means? So shit's going down. This is historic. Did I wear the right thing? Do I, do I look historic? Do I, is this how I, because I want to look good in the history books. Let me just, I want to look good. Everyone knows that this is a big deal. However, Iron Man and Captain America really just could not put their shit aside. Okay. The impressive guest list included the likes of President George W. of the United States, uh, Nelson Mandela, and even Fidel Castro. And then you have also Spider-Man and Man-Ape who start a fight and it causes all kinds of drama. For them to marry, the couple must be sent to the spirit world and meet with the panther goddess Bast. She has to meet Aurora and judge if she is worthy enough to join T'Challa's family and lineage. She's quickly accepted and within a blink of an eye, they're back surrounded by their loved ones at the ceremony. The priestess announces that Bast has approved the union and the two are wed. Their marriage lasts six years and one whole month, and for reasons. The main reason is that the writers had a difficult time writing about them both because you had them in different books. You had Black Panther, who was part of the Avengers, and you had Storm, who was part of the X-Men. So it was very difficult from a practical, logistic standpoint to keep that romantic relationship going. So it was written into their relationship that with the X-Men being declared enemies of Wakanda and with their very, very different commitments, the marriage just wasn't working. And so they divorced. And it's very sad because they, they loved each other very, very much. But being who they were and their associations, it just wasn't something that they could handle. T'Challa needed to put Wakanda and its people first, above all. And Storm was committed to her work with the X-Men and her students at Professor Xavier's school. So it just, it made sense that with them spending most of their time on separate missions, T'Challa ended up annulling the marriage while Storm was gone. She shows up to help T'Challa and the people of Wakanda in the aftermath after Namor destroyed Wakanda. That's the Phoenix Force story. We talked about that a little bit in the Echo video, but T'Challa was very angry, very angry and very hurt. He blamed Storm when she sided with the X-Men, blamed her that she was siding with the X-Men. And while she was gone, he announced that annulment with the High Priestess. In multiversal stories, Storm and Black Panther do have a child. In one multiverse, they have a son. His name is Azari T'Challa. And in another, they have a daughter named Chimera. And in both instances, the children do possess the mutant abilities of their mother, her white hair and her blue eyes, as well as their father's black Panther legacy. But her most profound legacy was the impact she had on the next generation of mutants, inspiring them to carry the torch of equality and justice ever forward. Her return to X Men comics after a brief absence was met with immense excitement. It reaffirmed her place as one of Marvel's most enduring character creations. What makes Storm truly iconic, though, is her ability to connect with readers from all walks of life. She's a symbol of diversity, strength, and a power for change. It's not just about her strength, though. Her moments of vulnerability, her struggles, and her determination to overcome them 
have made her a character with whom we can all relate. Today, Storm continues to lead, both as a member of the Quiet Council on Krakoa and as an inspiration for countless fans the world over. Well, that's all I have for you nerds today on Aurora Monroe, the Windrider Storm. If you like the content that I'm putting out there, please send a bolt to that like button, hit the subscribe, ring that notification bell. Again, if you'd like to support the channel, if you want to know the products I use, it's all listed in the description below. Until then, nerdlings, I hope you have a wizard day and I will see you in the next one. Stay nerdy, babies. Bye.